Yes, we can. Good. Thank you. Perfect. So yes, my name is Dennis de la Corte. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. My presentation um, is titled Successful Refinement with Modest Resources. And I have to put that into context. So with successful refinement, I mean it's successful in the context of CASP 14, which is a community challenge I will um, introduce to you. And with modest resources, I mean that most of the work I present to you has been conducted by undergraduates in my lab. So our goal was to establish protocols that new people in the lab could quickly learn and use with um, reasonable success at the end. So um, our lab looks like this. We are trying to build a center of molecular design here. So we research protein engineering, drug discovery and laboratory informatics. And we have a broad range of undergraduates from different disciplines working on our topics. So everything we do always has to be understandable to people from a variety of backgrounds. Um, if that being said, let's look into CASP. I assume that most of you have heard of this. It's an experiment that's been ongoing for um, almost 30 years now. Um, the story is that every two years, this critical um, assessment center for structure prediction is putting out a community challenge where they ask the community to go ahead and predict uh, computationally the three dimensional structure of a protein given only the amino acid sequence. So typically you don't have any experimental information, just the sequence. And um, the I mean, the alpha 4 2, I guess, has been mentioned quite a few times during this conference. Um, CASP was the battleground on where alpha 4 data was collected and then the model was tested and really showcased its uh, superior performance. Um, besides this major challenge of predicting structures from sequences, since CASP 14, there was also another subcategory in this um, community test, which is called the refinement category. And here, research groups are tasked to not go from sequence to structure, but to go from a somewhat reasonable predicted model to a somewhat better predicted model. So the idea is to take a computational protein structure and refine it a bit more so that it looks like an experimentally solved structure. Um, I myself have been part of this game since 2014 when I was in my PhD and used the first uh, time in molecular dynamics simulation method. And I'm just showing for historic, uh, historical background um, what type of refinements were possible back in the day. So on this graph, you can see on the x-axis a score that captures the quality of a protein structure prediction before refinement and on the y-axis after refinement. So this dashed line would mean that one is not able to make a structure better, but if you're above the line, it means you took a inferior model and made it somewhat better. If you're below the line, that means you messed up the model and destroyed some things that were right before. And as you can see, this kind of goes in both directions with the majority starting to be better. However, um, it's not like a con it was not a method that consistently refined all types of uh, predicted protein structures. Now, um, CASP has evolved since. And um, in order to understand all of the results, let me introduce a little bit of language. So there are two terms or scoring functions that are frequently being used to, uh, to quantify the quality of structures in this specific CASP community. And you might have heard of it, but if not, here's the definition. So the first score is called the GDTHA. That's a high accuracy score that takes a predicted protein structure and the experimental structure, overlaps them, and then calculates what fraction of C-alpha atoms fall into a certain radius. And that is a single number that is kind of like an RMSD, but has a higher accuracy in calculating how similar two structures are and is not as susceptible to um, like domain changes that can mess up my RMSD a bit more. A different score that we use is called the LDTT. That's a local distance difference score. That one can again calculate the difference between an experimental structure and a um, predicted structure, but it doesn't require superposition. What you do is you calculate a distance network between heavy atoms. For example, for a given um, C alpha atom, you connect um, that one to all of the other heavy atoms that are within 15 ang angstrom of the experimental structure. And then you have this distance network. And then you calculate exactly the same distance network for the corresponding C alpha atom in your predicted structure. And then you take the difference between these distances. 
And um, when this difference between the distances falls under a certain threshold, then you call that that was a hit or a successfully positioned atom. And so that is a score that is now being used quite frequently. Um, also the Alpha Fold 2, for example, uses that for internal assessment of their quality um, or confidence score predictions of um, their models. And the nice thing about the LDTT score is that it works on a residue per residue basis. So you don't only get one number for the whole protein, but you can effectively get a number for each heavy atom inside of your, um, inside of your model. Okay, so if we look at the most recent CASP, CASP 14, um, here are the refinement results. I think Dan Rick gave a presentation yesterday, so you might have seen this. Um, what he uh, found is that only four groups from all the CAS participants, and this, there's a right tail to the distribution that I cut off, um, but only four of the groups that participated were able to refine predicted protein structures um, beyond um, where, they, where they started. So this pink bar is the starting model, everything to the left improved. Um, three of these top, met um, top methods are based on molecular dynamics, or MD. And um, I want to talk about those in more detail. Um, I have here the results shown for all of the CASP targets. So a CASP target is a single protein that was predicted, and they had about 55 of those um, as refinement targets. And for each one of them, we have, again, uh, quality of the target before it was refined and after it was refined. And you can see here the performance of the three different groups, where um, these two groups are both led by the same PI called Michael Feig, who um, uses on one side, um, like his postdoc does a manual uh, pipeline, and then he also has a server set up that is automatically doing the refinement. Our group was this uh, undergraduate driven project. And what you can see when you look at the distribution of these points is that the red stars are a bit closer to the diagonal. So our method is a bit more um, conservative. So we don't see a lot of fluctuation. When we make things better, we make it a bit better. When we make it worse, it's not a ton worse. But if you look into the blue and um, green symbols, they spread a lot further. That is due to the way the MD simulations are being set up. So it's a bit more of an aggressive protocol that can give you higher yields, um, but also potentially damages your model a bit more. Um, what's especially important to note is that on the very right here, those are um, targets that have a very high um, GDTHA score before refinement. Those are targets that have been predicted with alpha fold two, and those were not possible. It was not possible. Um, to refine those with the MD-based methods. And so that's a consistent theme that I'm going to talk about, that it's going to be very difficult to use MD-based methods to further refine computationally predicted structures that come out of Alpha Fold 2 or Rosetta Fold or similar methods. If you haven't been exposed to molecular dynamics and how it's been used in refinement, here's the rough idea in a little workflow. So assume that you have been given a start structure that someone says, I built this, but I'm not quite sure if it's right. Can you refine this further? Um, the idea behind MD-based refinement is you take the start structure and you throw it in a molecular dynamic simulation, which effectively simulates the protein being in water, having some temperature and kinetic energy. So it's wobbling around. And as this wobbles around, it explores a certain conformational space. And this conformational space can be represented uh, with the individual snapshots of the simulation. And so these snapshots can then be ranked by some scoring function that tries to assess if that is a confirmation that I would likely see in a PDB structure or not. And then based on this confidence score that this is a reasonable representation of a well-relaxed protein structure, you can rank these and the most successful refinement protocols take then a top percentage of these ranked snapshots and averages those. And the finally average structure, that is then what we deem the refined structure, which hopefully is now a bit closer to what you would get out of an experiment compared to the start structure. So the different MD-based refinement methods that are out there, um, they have some things in common and some things are different about them. Here's an overview of the FIG method compared to the method that our lab uses. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the details, what's different between them. The only thing I want to point out is that they are both MD methods. They use 
the same logic with regards to setting up the simulations and conducting the um, the like the time you use to equilibrate the system and before you actually start letting it wobble. That's all similar. And the final analysis of how you extract the frames from the MD simulation and how you rank them before you average them, that's also similar. Um, but the things that are different and that are worthwhile to point out is the amount of manual work that the FIG method requires. So in order to improve um, from the start structure, it's not necessarily enough to just take the PDB structure that was given and throw that in the water, in the simulation with water and let it wobble around, but you might want to do some smart tweaks. And so in their recent report, um, they have explained how they do that and they modify by saying, um, if I have a start structure, I don't necessarily have to restrain myself to the current confirmation, but I can also look for homologous structures in the PDB that might have slightly different confirmations. And then I can start a refinement protocol, not only from this one start state, but from various starting confirmations. So that requires you know, homology search, finding different um, confirmations, and then mapping a structure onto uh, a sequence onto an existing structure. So that's a manual step. Something else that they have tried is um, a manual insertion of potential um, binding ligands. So if you, for some reason, know that this specific protein is likely going to have a ligand, um, you can model it in there and try to run simulations with that ligand. Or if you know that this is a protein that likely lives in a complex, you can try to um, guess what that complex might look like based on the starting structure that you have. But all of this is kind of guesswork where you need a lot of um, expert knowledge and intuition that definitely exceeded the level of experience that the undergraduates in my lab had. So we didn't try to do anything of those fancy things. We just went ahead and said, let's just take the start model that we have and run MD simulations on it and see what comes out. So our protocol is a bit um, more simplified. So what we can see here is that we start with an initial model. We always use the same number of simulations. So one common strategy in MD is that instead of running, letting one protein wobble for a very long time, you rather run multiple short simulations um, because otherwise you might have um, rare events that drive your wobbling into a direction that is not um, statistically likely, but happened to, have, uh, happened to happen in this um, first time where you run the simulation. So by running multiple ones in parallel, you get better statistics. Um, so after we have five of these wobbling trajectories um, created, we then extract the frames, we score them, and take a certain percentage of them, average that, and call the final model ready for um, a little bit of local optimization. Because one thing you will always see is when you average PDB snapshots. So we have this um, protein and it has different conformations. They're all somewhat similar, but also a bit different. So when you average them, your backbone looks kind of good, but the atoms in the side chains, they look very bad because the rotor mares are fluctuating quite a bit doing the MD. And so in order to fix that, we use a tool called Squirrel 4 um, from um, the Dunbreck lab that replaces the side chains and makes them look more realistic. And once we have that in place, we can do one final relaxation of the protein backbone to then yield the final optimized structure. Um, this pipeline has been scripted in um, Bash and Python, and we have made it available um, on GitHub. So if anyone wants to use this, uh, you have to install the necessary programs for it, but then the pipeline is there. You can just throw a PDB in, it will run through it, produce the trajectories and the final optimized structure. So once we had this set up for CASP, this was really just a click a button, wait two days, and then have the final structure pop out. So that was a nice automatic workflow. So how good does this method do? Um, here are some insights of what went well. So we have here always three structures overlaid. One of them um, in pink, that's the start structure. So that has been predicted and given to us. And then in gold, the target structure. That's like the experimentally solved structure you want to achieve. Five and minutes so remaining. Great, thank you. Um, what we can see here is, for example, that the start alpha helix was moved into the target structure. And here, similarly, the pink um, um, alpha helix was moved into this uh, blue position here, closer to the target. And so that's the type of refinement that we normally see. 
that we are able to take secondary structure elements and move them in the right spot. Um, that doesn't always work. So here, for example, we have an um, here we have a case where the start structure was so bad with the terminus pointing in the very wrong direction that um, the refinement, how it's currently being set up with quite strong constraints is not able to move um, this part of the protein over, structure over into the other direction. So here we wouldn't really see any improvement. And sometimes, you know, when you have here, for example, a predicted alpha helix where it should be a loop, we're not really able to unfold that either. So there are certain limitations to what these constraint and these simulations can achieve. The worst case is, of course, when you try to make things better and it doesn't happen. Um, here, for example, we have a loop region that should have moved downwards, but it moved upwards. Similarly here, um, and when, when that happens, typically in loop regions, um, it's not quite clear if that's a result from, based on the flexibility of a protein, where inside of the MD flexibility can be way more explored than inside of the crystal, um, like in the crystal structure, where it's more restrained and has maybe some artifacts on the packing. Um, so that's, that's something where it's always sad when we see our scores go down because uh, loops fluctuate in unappreciated ways. Um, given that all of this refinement works only on the old class of computationally predicted models, but not so well in AlphaFold 2, a valid question is, why do we even care about this? Is there anything we can learn from MD refinement trajectories? And I believe there is. There are two types of analysis I want to share with you. One of them is shown here. What we are displaying here is the correlation um, between two things. Let me introduce. The first one is when we take a start structure and then let it wobble around, we can calculate the difference between all the frames in the MD and the start structure. So, and then calculate the average of these differences that's plotted on the X axis. On the Y axis, we take the difference between the start structure and the experimental structure. And what we can see is a strong correlation. This correlation indicates that if I model a protein wrongly and throw it in an MD, it's gonna wobble a lot more than a protein that I throw in that is already quite good in its um, starting accuracy. And so we can use this as a predictive measure to say, you give me a model, I simulate it, and then I can look at the num amount of fluctuation and can tell you based on how much it fluctuated, if it was likely a good or a bad model. So that can be good for model assessment on the global scale with the GDT score. Um, we can also do the same thing with this local score, the LDDT score. And here we are just looking at a single protein structure where we map um, the so-called root mean square fluctuation of all of the um, residues. So root mean square fluctuation measures how much is the alpha atom is wobbling around. And the ILDDT score is this difference metric I introduced earlier. And so what we can see here again is a correlation and if we visualize it on a structure, it would look, look like this. So here in blue, we have the start structure, but we color it between blue and red, dependent on the amount of um, fluctuation or RMSF. And what we can see is that the red shaded residues, the ones that fluctuate most in the simulation, are also the ones that differ most from the true experimentally solved structure in gold. And so we can use this LDTT measure to understand which parts of our model are probably not as good as we would like them to be. So just a minute or so left, if you can. Thank you. Yep. So um, to, to end this, where does um, refinement go from here? So it's very really hard to refine um, deep learning models like the AlphaFold 2s. So we do no longer expect refinement to be a category within CAST. Uh, the type of enhancements that might be possible would require us to also integrate machine learning. Probably would be very challenging without the motivation of this um, conference behind us. What I'm personally most interested in is to go away from the idea that MD should be used to refine protein structures. We should rather use it to assess quality, uh, the quality of structures and then also to represent structures in the more complex environments like the cell where they normally live in which is something that machine learning will probably not be able to represent in the near future. So with this, I'm uh, grateful for your attention. And if you have more questions, please uh, reach out to me. Hey, thank you. That's fantastic. Um, so do we have time for a couple of questions from Slack or Q&A if we have them?
Yes, so we've got a question in, uh, um, in the absence of the correct structure, can you predict if your MD refined model is better or worse than the starting model? Um, so what we can do is we can use these assessments to get a feeling for how bad the starting model was. And so one thing we can say for sure is that models that have a very high starting accuracy are most difficult to refine. So if we use, for example, this analysis here to say, oh, we're most likely dealing with an average um, structure was predicted, we can be quite confident that our refinement structure um, ended up improving it. Um, but that's the best metric we have at this point in the absence of a um, experimental structure to compare against. Another question that we have is, uh, what are the differences between MD-based refinement and the old simulated annealing-based refinement? So simulated annealing, um, it's typically just a reduction in temperature. So there would be um, more like a minimization approach. You throw a force field at the structure and you relax it inside of that um, inside of this force field, but you're not really exploring configurational space. So the difference is if you, for example, have an alpha helix that is wrongly positioned with an MD-based approach, you might be able to sample sufficient conformational space to put it in the right position, while the simulated annealing would be a more restricted to one-time optimizations, but not really exploration. And there's one more question. Um, as far as I know, at least the uh, alpha fold models submitted via Jupyter Collab are already amber relaxed. Can you can that explain that your remark that you cannot refine the alpha fold models? I think the more fundamental problem is that the alpha fold two models are so overly engineered to represent PDB structures um, that they get super close towards this um, crystallized conformation, where in um, the MD-based methods, we are really dealing with complex uh, trajectories that have different ensembles in them. And so I think that the dynamics that MD inherently brings with it make it very hard to compete against a method that has been optimized to really come extremely close to an experimental structure within an accuracy that an MD, even if you would start the molecular dynamic simulation from the correct experimental structure, you would not be able to we regain that experimental structure with the same accuracy as alpha fold 2 is now able to go to just from the sequence and hey. another another question maybe last one is the average of the snapshots a linear average or an average weighted weighted by probability um, because some frames within the md simulation will occur multiple times um, it is sort of like an average uh, a weighted average um, but every frame by itself is treated as an individual value. So it is not weighted by definition, but if you think about it, it will appear like a weighted average, just sort of based on the Boltzmann distribution and allowing it. That's great. So thanks very much. I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next speaker.